Though the beginning of wisdom is reverence for the Lord, at least according to the Bible, we often reverence many things without any connection to God. Nature, land, work, houses, cars, possessions, pets, technology, Taylor Swift, Patrick Mahomes, or some other celebrity. We're like the lady who encountered actor Robert Redford in a Santa Fe, New Mexico ice cream parlor. He was between movie takes. She was determined to stay cool and pretended to ignore the presence of the movie star. But after leaving the shop, she realized she did not have the ice cream cone she had bought and paid for. So she returned to the shop and asked for her ice cream cone. And overhearing the conversation, Robert Redford said, Madam, you'll probably find it where you put it, in your purse. <laughs> Reverence is a strange thing and can do strange things to us. Reverence for the original blessing of God's creation should include reverence for the gift of human intimacy at least according to the Old Testament book called the Song of Songs. Now, I think you'd have to agree with me, in our busy world, intimacy is often lacking. The communications industry of our day, through internet and social media and newspapers and magazines and TV and radio, puts out an enormous amount of words and images. And the industry thinks that such communication will bring us together and solve our problems. But all the words and images often lack intimacy. And even when we do find out, uh, when we, we look at these words and images, we discover that when we do find out what another person has to say, we often like that person less, whether politician, family member, or even preacher. We seem to be growing apart, and as many uh, observers of human behavior reflect, we are more lonely all the time. Some years ago, award-winning journalist Bill Bishop wrote a book, The Big Sort, Why the Clustering of Like-Minded America is Tearing Us Apart. And in the book, he tries to, to tell the story of why America is so culturally and politically divided. Beyond our individualism and separations, we've spent decades, he says, sorting ourselves into like-minded communities, not just by region or state, but by narrower and narrower groups and neighborhoods, cities, and even churches. We choose communities and media compatible with our lifestyles and beliefs becoming so ideologically inbred that we don't know and can't understand those who live a few miles from us or even a few doors down. We long for deeper connection, but seem to be finding it with fewer and fewer people, even those within our family circles at times. But despite it all, intimacy, human intimacy, is something longed for by many. And yet it is so hard to find and experience. Recent observers of human behavior have identified at least three styles of human intimacy. One style is avoidant intimacy. People with this style, about 30% of Americans, would rather do anything but talk about feelings. They would rather not defend, depend on others or have others depend on them. They escape by watching others, reading about others, observing sports and events where others perform, checking in on others through social media. They are fiercely independent and live with somewhat of an emotional shield between themselves and others. Often these people come out of a family who treated them with some neglect and even at times cold rejection. I wouldn't say that about my family, but I have tendencies, strong tendencies toward this stuff. 
A second style uh, is anxious intimacy, encompassing about 20% of Americans. And people of this style want closeness with others, but find themselves reluctant to get close to them. And this makes them jittery and anxious and jealous and demanding of attention and prone to feeling loved, inappropriate in requests. And often these people come out of a family where parents treated them with inconsistency. A third style, though, of is secure intimacy, comprising the remaining 50% of Americans, and I'm sure all of you here today. People with this style feel safe with others, are willing to be close, to trust without fear of being hurt. They may have different interests than others, but draw others to themselves because they exhibit respect. They're able to talk about anything with anyone, even those outside their own sort or group or tribe. And usually these people come out of families where the parents showed consistent warmth and attention. Now the third style of intimacy, secure int intimacy, seems to be the kind of intimacy described in the Song of Songs. Amid the five love poems of the book, the man and the woman celebrate not merely sexual love, but a deep, passionate intimacy of human souls. And this intimacy has at least four characteristics. The intimacy of the Song of Songs is marked first by permanence, enduring presence, permanence. Note the phrase that appears several times in the book, the phrase, your love is better than wine. How many of you believe that? Down through human history, wine has been associated with social expression. Wine or some other alcohol supposedly lifts people from isolation into shared fellowship. It helps people from keeping everything within, from dwelling so, too much on the self and their own feelings of inadequacy. As a yes drug, it releases guilt and inhibitions. But we all suspect that alcohol's intimacy is usually superficial and temporary. But love's intimacy goes much deeper. Love's intimacy leads to loyalty, commitment, long-term relationships, and permanence. Being there for another seeing another through when others think they are through. Preacher and storyteller Tex Sample, who once spoke at our annual conference, tells of the time he and his wife returned from a midnight party on a sub-zero night. He immediately fell into a deep sleep under bone-warming covers, only to be awakened by his wife puking in the bathroom. He wanted to sleep and stay under the covers, remembering the words of a psychologist. I'm not in this world to live up to your expectations. You're not in this world to live up to mine. But if we find each other, it's beautiful. But he knew the expectations that he and his wife had to be there for each other, for better, for worse, permanently. He managed to pull himself out of bed hold a wet wash rag, mumble futile words of comfort, and to offer sleepy pats on the least engaged part of his wife's puking body. Between the heaves, she apologized for waking him up. But then in Texas' own words, for some strange reason in those moments, I remembered the day we met and her laughing at my bad jokes. Now, with both of us half naked, she on her knees, me on my butt, I knew I was engaged in the school for learning intimacy. In moments like these, Eros becomes not sexual passion, but agape, an emphatic feeling for her, wanting her ultimate good. Between the violent disgorgements, she reached over to hold my hand. And I realized I'd rather offer her wet wash rags sitting around the toilet 
than drink wine and dance the cotillion ball with anyone else. In even wretched moments like these, you find yourself participating in a wonderful gift. The intimacy of the Song of Songs is marked not just by permanence, but by the personal. The book begins with words about kissing. Your lips cover me with kisses. Your love is better than wine. There is a fragrance about you. The sound of your name recalls it. Translations read, your name is oil poured out. And in Hebrew, the words for name and oil sound alike. In Hebrew, they sound alike, and a name representing another's being and sound affects the ears as the fragrance of perfume-like oil affects the nose. The sound and smell of a name is not just the sound and smell of any name. It is the sound and smell of a particular named person. As long as we are taught and addressed in Mass, our name never falls upon us with the power that heals our wounds lifts our hearts, and enables us to walk and rise. Only in intimacy, when the name is spoken in love, does the power of the name bless and heal. I remember a man who told me he grew up in a congregation as a boy. And that many of the pastors there would always greet him, most every Sunday. But there was one pastor that always greeted him by name. And he never forgot it. And he attributes his, his uh, continuing in the Christian walk to this pastor who called him by name. The intimacy of the Song of Songs is marked not only by permanence, not only by the personal, but also by pain. And note the places in this book where the longing and tension and difficulty, delayed fulfillment, pain are, are involved in the man and woman seeking each other. In chapter 5, the man knocks, but it takes effort for the woman to get up, to get dressed, and to answer the door. And when she does so, the man is gone. She goes searching for him in the night. And the text says that she was beaten up by the sentries on the street. But she continues the search. Intimacy is always searching for the heart and love of another, of others, even amid pain difficulty, and dark nights of the soul, pain. Yesterday morning, I came in from a run with Zeke, my dog. Took him off the leash and put him on a lead, what's called a a lead wire out in in the yard. And about that time, one of our feral cats ran by and he took off like a rocket. The cable caught me in the back of my legs, drawing blood leaving quite an imprint in great pain. I showed Janet and said, Janet, we need to discipline this dog. You need to discipline this dog. And she said, Zeke, higher, higher, neck higher. (laughs) And then she gave him treats. (laughs) I'm a preacher and I wouldn't lie about this. But Janet and I have also been fans of the British TV series, Doc Martin. If you've ever seen the series, it is the story of a doctor who has no people skills at all. In part because he was raised by parents who didn't want him. He bluntly tells people to stop talking, calls them idiots and imbeciles. But on the other hand, is a brilliant doctor. With a blood phobia, that causes him to throw up at the sight of blood or even pass out. So he ends up not in the big city of London as a precocious, skilled surgeon as most of his educators thought he would be, but in a small seaside village as a general practice doctor, treating and saving the lives of many quirky characters. But somehow, the Song of Songs happens to him human intimacy. He falls in love with a village school teacher. And on their first kiss in a car, he indicates her oral hygiene needs improvement, getting him booted out of the car onto the road. 
Eventually, though, he marries her. And together they endure great pain, turmoil, separations, counseling, and the birth of two children. But after one supposedly final separation, with him projected to leave and take a job in London, he saves the life of a husband whose wife took him, the doctor, hostage at gunpoint, forcing an improvised medical procedure on a hillside. And afterwards, Doc Martin sits with his estranged wife on that hillside. And the Song of Songs conversation goes like this. She says, Well done. You saved his life. It was an unusual situation, he said. But it's all unusual. You know, I think, she says, I made a terrible mistake. I think maybe I'm a bit obsessed with everyone having to be normal. People aren't, are they? No. I'm not. You're not, are you? But you're unusual. Yes. And she continues, everyone said you left me for London, but I knew you'd never let me down. I just knew you wouldn't. I knew it in my heart. You're the only person who's never let me down. And he responds, I'm never going to change the way I feel about you. And I've tried. And she says, I don't want that. Can we go home now? And they kiss. Revealing the series to, to be a modern day Song of Songs love story with all the pain and reality that every such story involves. And is that not the story of the gospel? Despite our appearances, I'm abnormal, you're abnormal, but we are each unusual, saved in love, the love exemplified in Jesus. The gospel story, Doc's story, and our stories call to mind the words of famed spiritual writer and Catholic theologian Henry Nouwen. He said, In our woundedness, we become sources of life for others. Nobody escapes woundedness. We are all wounded people, whether physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. The main question is not, how do we hide our wounds so we don't have to be embarrassed, but how can we put our woundedness in service of others? When our wounds cease to be a source of shame and become a source of healing, we have become wounded healers. The intimacy of the Song of Songs is marked not only by permanence, not only by the personal, not only by pain, but lastly, by passion. Such passion goes beyond communication and ends up in deep communion. Communication involves words used to sell things, to ask for a dish on a table, to direct traffic, to teach algebra. But communion involves words that tell stories, that nurture, that develop trust, that help create love, that forgive and that share the depths of the soul. A pastor tells how he used to take his young daughter with him to visit nursing homes. He observed that she was more valuable than any of his pastoral skills, any of his Bible reading, and any of his prayers. Residents brightened immediately when she entered a room, delighted in her smiles, touched her skin, and stroked her hair. And one resident uh, in, in the advanced stages of dementia told the daughter a story from childhood. And when she finished, the woman told the story again and again and again. And finally, the pastor ended the visit for fear of his daughter that she was uncomfortable. And on the way home, he commended her for her patience and attentiveness, reminding her that the woman's mind was not working the way it was supposed to. And the little girl said, Oh, I knew that, Daddy. She wasn't telling me anything. She was telling me who she was. This daughter knew the power of communion through the passion of intimacy. Now, it should not surprise us that the Song of Songs, a book describing intimacy between a man and a woman, 
has been used symbolically and metaphorically in Jewish and Christian circles, and this is probably the primary interpretation, to refer and describe the intimacy with God and with Jesus. You remember Jesus told us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, and the second commandment, to love the Lord our God with all our mind, our heart, our soul, our strength, our power. This is the commandment to intimacy with the divine. 12th century Catholic monk of the French church, Bernard of Clairvaux, in trying to help his people fulfill this communion commandment of love, preached 86 sermons on the Song of Songs and barely got beyond chapter 2. Now, if you remember, I preached two series here that were 57 series long. You don't remember that, I'm sure. Or maybe you do. And there was one series, Meeting God in the Darkness. You thought I was in the darkness too long. But he preached 86 sermons because he believed so intensely on the intimacy of this book and this passage. Intimacy with God involves permanence. We make a, co a permanent covenant, a commitment, a continual yes, offering the essence of all we are to God, even as God offers the divine self to us. Intimacy with God involves the personal. Whatever else we believe about God, we believe God is somehow relational and personal. And metaphorically, we can at least believe that God speaks our name and invites us to intimately address the divine as Abba, Daddy, Father, Holy Mother. Intimacy with God involves pain. There is always in the life of faith the dark night of the soul Times of absence, questions, seeking, yearning, finding, and sacrificing. But intimacy with God above all involves passion, communion, trust, forgiveness, sharing one's soul, deep lovemaking, and abandonment. Is this not the heart, the crucial meaning of what we call the most uh, popular ritual of the Christian church, which is communion. When we, we repeat the simple words of Jesus, this is my body, this is my blood. These words do not merely describe. They reveal, point, reach, embrace. Make us intimate in the passion of deep communion with God the God we love through Jesus. And these words reach back to the Jewish Passover, which, in case you don't know, is the feast at which the Song of Songs was and is still read to this day. In a world where there is so much persistent sin, separation, big sorting into groups, violence, lack of peace, let us be the people who experience a witness to human intimacy. To intimacy in general, not only with one another, but most of all, the one we call God. Please pray with me. God, in these moments, we remember the words of that saint of the church of the brethren, Anna Mal. She said, whenever we read 1 Corinthians 13, we should change the word love to I. I am patient and kind. I am not jealous or conceited or proud. I am not ill-mannered or selfish or irritable. I do not keep a record of wrongs. I am not happy with evil, but I am happy with the truth. I never give up, and my faith, hope, and patience never fail. Let this love be the heart of our intimacies. Amen.